you join me today at the wheel of something astonishingly rare. It's an Alpha, it's a Nissan. It should never have been, it's an abomination. It's not an Arna, it's a Nissan Cherry Europe. And if you like, unbelievably rare, unusual, different cars like this, and please do hit the subscribe button and smash the bell notification, which is that corner, I think, and so you can see when more things are coming on the channel soon. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we're looking at a car which is either forgotten entirely or remembered not fondly and perhaps for the wrong reasons. And today, in this case, isn't even the car you think you're looking at. This isn't an Alfa Romeo Arna, this is actually a Nissan Cherry Europe GTI. There you go. Now, many people, even Al Fisti, who know the range pretty well, may be unaware of the fact that the Arna and the Cherry were built side by side in the Alfa Romeo factory. Well, a specifically new Alfa Romeo factory put together exactly for this purpose. This is because in 1980, Alfa Romeo desperately needed a new small car to replace the Sud. It was already a decade old and needed replacing. So with no money in the bank, they looked around for a partner and they found Nissan. There was a promise of an eight car deal working into the future, which would have spawned some quite interesting crossovers in the future. So this was the early days first edition project, which maybe wasn't as exciting as other ones were going to be in the future, but certainly gave an idea of what was to come. So what we essentially have is a pulsar body shell with many Alpha Sud parts underneath the skin and quite a few Nissan parts under the skin as well. Let's be clear about that, it's not all Alpha. To comply with the Italian rules of origin, 85% of the car had to be locally sourced. So a lot of it was built and made in Italy. And the car was assembled in Italy from pressing kits that were sent over from Japan. So they pressed out the panels of a Pulsar, shipped them over to Italy where they were assembled. That 85% doesn't mean mass, it means amount of parts. So even though the biggest part of the car really is the, the body and the shell itself, the engine, although quite a bit smaller, contains many moving objects, many small parts. Lights, for example, are small, cheap and easy to make. So Alfa Romeo, with no money, can make an injection molded light or some glass, which is not too expensive to produce, and that then goes into the cars. There is a certain hint that Nissan weren't too bothered about this project because the number of Alfa Romeo logos all over this car is stunning. Now the changes between the Alpha and the Nissan really were incredibly minimal. Really it was just the badging. This grill has got a Nissan badge on it, the uh, boot has got a Nissan badge on it, but even the fog light covers are still Alfa Romeo branded. So from a Nissan buyer's point of view, perhaps this was quite an exciting, good purchase because although there was a full range of, of pulse holes already from the basic one liter up to the turbo, this was a slightly odd car in terms of positioning because it kind of sat alongside, maybe slightly above the top of the range, but it was very highly specced and offered good value and they sold incredibly well. However, Nissan buyers were probably thinking with an eye towards reliability and uh, Alpha as a brand wasn't necessarily known for that, especially not at that time. Alpha buyers on the other hand though, would have been disappointed by the fact it didn't look like an Alpha. It looks far too unexciting for an Alpha. At the front we've got the Nissan grille with the interesting green stripe, green being a theme throughout this car of, of highlighting stuff, making it look good. You'll notice the Italian made lights and grille at the front actually protrude ever so slightly from the front of the car. This is because the box of flat four doesn't quite package properly inside the Nissan body, so it has to push ever so slightly forward to make room for the radiator. Fortunately, it does have these big plastic wraparound bumpers and this underskirt, which disguise that fairly well until someone like me comes along and ruins it by pointing it out. You probably hadn't noticed. I will apologise right now if you can hear the tractor behind the fence. People have commented in the past that whenever I film stuff near where I live, you can hear road noise constantly. I've driven 200 miles into the wilds of, of the wilds, basically, and a tractor has started behind the hedge. I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do about that. Right, so underneath the skin, there was a choice of two engines in the Nissan, with the 1.2, of which there's one left in the UK, and the 1.5, of which I believe there are two left. It uses the Sud's flat four boxer engine, which is a great engine, and it also uses the entire suspension and running gear from the same car as well. Perhaps the reason they chose the Cherry as the car to partner up with was because it was the same size and they could fit that running gear in with no alterations. In fact, they even kept a slightly unusual 98 millimeter stud pattern wheels, which allows them to use these rather cool bottle cap wheels. Unfortunately, it meant the wheels on the back didn't fit on the Nissan rear suspension. It uses the Pulsar slash Cherry. It's the same car in different markets. 
uh, rear suspension, but with a slightly altered cross member to give it pretty intense rear camber. So it must have been quite an incredible feat to make the rear end of a soft handling Nissan work with the hard handling front end of an Alpha, although I did in the end up deleting the anti-roll bar from the front. So maybe that works together that way. Now here at the back, they've done a few more changes to keep things exciting and Alfa romeo -y. For example, we've got this big, very 1980s solid rubber spoiler. No 1980 sports car is complete without a solid rubber spoiler which weighs more than the entire tailgate alone. We do of course have the Cherry Europe badging because the Cherry name was only used in Europe and the rest of the world it was called a Pulsar. And we have the GTI badging in green. More of that green highlighting. Now you'll notice these tailgate lights are much slimmer, more delicate looking than the regular Nissan Pulsar Cherry tail lights, which are big blocky items. They've managed to fit these because they've taken the rear pressing panel from a car called the Langley, which is a Japan only model. There was also a Langley in South Africa, but that was just a Cherry with a different name. The Langley in Japan was a far more young inspired kind of version of the Pulsar. So it's the same car, but again, more or badge engineering. And so they've been able to put these different lights in which differentiate it and give it a bit of a different look. We've also got the big chunky wraparound bumpers again. And you'll notice this particular car has got the Road Tune logo on its number plate. This is the original dealer who were an Alfa Romeo dealer. And this car was originally shipped, although it was a Nissan, with stick on Alfa badges. So I'm not quite sure how a bunch of Nissan cars wound up with an Alfa specialist being sold as new cars with, uh, yeah, stick on Alfa badges. So here we are under the bonnet, you can see the Italian flat four here, also notably you can see the Italian electrics which amazingly didn't put off the buyers and the Nissan dealerships quite as much as you think it might do. Now you can also see, <coughs> now a characteristic of the flat four is it is very nose forward in the engine bay. Down here underneath where I'm pointing right now is the uh, transmission output from the gearbox to the drive shafts which are running parallel just there to front wheel drive obviously. And with the bonnet up you can see now this large plastic area on top of the grille and everything just shunted forward to fit the radiator in here. Now something you can say for Alfa Romeo which doesn't count for many manufacturers is that almost every one of their engines goes down as one of the greats and the Boxer is of course yet another one of the greats. They are incredibly car charming, characterful, make a unique sound and have amazing delivery of power. They just rev almost like a motorbike engine. They're just amazing units. Although this layout can give you slightly nose heavy handling. And you will of course notice there is absolutely no attempt to disguise the fact it's got an Alfa Romeo VIN plate here in the car and Alfa Romeo heads on the engine. It's not even tried to disguise it. Maybe it was a selling point from the point of view of the uh, Nissan dealers. You can tell his owner's taking care of his car. He's got an Alfa Romeo oil filter in there. Right now we have climbed inside the Cherry Europe, which in some respects looks very similar to a Japanese Cherry or any other Pulsar, but in other ways is totally different. We've got this unique bright green Alfa Romeo styled interior with the uh, headrests and the rear also in the bright green, which does dictate the color scheme to pretty much everything else in the car having to match that. Let's go open the door to give you a better look at this door card. Now the fixtures and fittings are from the cherry parts bin, but the door card itself is Alfa Romeo. Many parts, of course, as I said, were made and sourced in Italy. Um, this is a different zigzag style, very Bauhaus in, in its appearance with this not quite level line all the way across the bottom of the door. I don't know if this is because it's meant to look startling and exciting or because they just put the ruler in the wrong place and went with it, because it's straight at the top. At the top, we have got the mirrors, which are adjustable on the inside. Now coming inside the car, as I mentioned, the shell did come from Japan. However, the floor pan is Italian because I had to make differences for the gearbox and things and the pedal boxes from the Alpha uh, Sud as well. So this is all completely different and sourced in Italy. This also means these bits of plastic down here are sourced in Italy and they are vacuum formed rather than injection molded. So they feel a bit more flimsy and, and cheap than they would have done in the Japanese car. And also down beside the Alpha pedals, there is a footrest, which the other Nissans did not get. Now looking up to the top, we have got a Nissan dashboard. This is an expensive and difficult part to engineer and to, to make, to mold. So this was made in Japan, shipped over and fitted in Italy. Now you'll notice we have got these oval 
egg-shaped dials. We've got the temperature on the left, we've got the speedo, the rev counter, the fuel gauge, and all the warning lights in this little patterned plastic with a elongated grid around the elongated dials. Now, if you look at other cars in the range, there is another dashboard binnacle which has got round dials with orange um, markings which looks far more sporty but perhaps that wouldn't fit into this perhaps it clashed with the uh, green interior who knows but the rest of this is pure nissan cherry nissan pulsar on the higher level ones in other models you do have the electric mirror adjustment living down here above the bonnet release your loud speaker again is above your pedals in the bottom of the dashboard. Over to the left, we've got no radio. Radio because, well, things were cheapened out to the extreme. Just a blanking plate where the radio would go. You do get a lighter and a sweetie wrapper tray. No air conditioning, just basic air vintage. And all your switches and controls, hazard lights, rear wash wipe, fog lights, and so forth are all along here on this strip along here. Now the steering wheel, is an exciting Alfa Romeo three-spoke perforated wheel, which looks very cool, but it has got a Nissan badge in the center of it to make it look interesting and exciting. It's an Alfa 33 steering column, so the, the um, ignition control is on the left-hand side. I believe it's made by Valia. And on the right-hand side, we have got this huge butterfly-type knob control to adjust the rake of the steering column, which is currently sitting in my lap. Oops. And because this is Nissan here, alpha here and this is where the two parts meet there's nothing really available to fill this gap so they've just used some bits of kind of hard rubber stuff just to fill the void which well works in as much as that it exists and nothing more now what else to say up here we have of course got the the cherry hanging from the mirror we've got a nice big interior light perforated headlining and we've got a pop-up sunroof i won't open this because it doesn't leak at the moment if i open it maybe it will now as with any nissan cherry pull that handle and then you can climb into the back where we find the green and black uh, seats. Now interestingly, these seats do fold forward but they do not split. On the 1.2 litre and the rest of the Nissan range I think, uh, they are split in the centre so you can have a 50-50 folding seat which is very practical. On the 1.5 flagship, they do not. This makes very little sense to me. In the back we've also got cubby holes left and right for the passengers in the back spare stuff there are not seat belts in the back for the rear passengers interestingly but there is a little cubby hole and a small ashtray so you have multiple ways to die one cool thing here in the front we have got the britax seat belts but they are datsun badged which is kind of cool now to get into the boot we do have that lever there now interestingly this boot is quite distinctive with this little lip on here and they didn't do a lot in fact anything to disguise it this draws your eye a little but not entirely uh, interestingly on the t turbo version there's a much bigger spoiler and there is um, a black graphic which completely disguises this so they could have done more in fact this is basically an option a dealer option spoiler which doesn't have the molded in logo that normally came from Nissan, and the brackets are welded on rather than riveted on, so they could have done a lot more to disguise its origins. Now in the back, we've got a fairly good sized boot because Nissan Sunny, so it's a very practical family car. Interestingly, the European Nissans didn't get this split folding uh, parcel shelf. They just got a solid one. And also we do have a couple of handy cubby holes here in the side. Although this is instead of loudspeakers, so. Right, so, fire the key, which turns the wrong way on the wrong side of the uh, steering column. Takes a bit of a blip, it's a Delorto. I say, it takes a bit of a blip. Delorto DRLA 36, it's quite a small Delorto, or Delortos. And then once it's running, it's happy. Away we go, it's a sprightly little thing, up to 30 quite happily. Now I will mention this adjustable steering column doesn't adjust up quite far enough for me to see anything above five miles an hour. In fact, everything between five and 80 is a mystery to me. I have no clue how fast we're going right now, so I'm trusting the other cars in front to be doing the right speed limit. 
the gear shift is astonishingly rubbery and going from moving from ratio to ratio is a little bit of force required to get it into the right aspect or plane and at a low speed you do find it tracks a little bit wanders getting up to speed though five speed manual nice it lightens up quite a lot and you can really feel things a bit more delicately and the problem they had is that the alpha is a tightly sprung sports car with pretty decent handling the sunny the pulsar is is not it's quite soft and quite woolly and so they must have done an awful lot of balancing to try and make these two fit together hence the fact it has not got an anti-roll bar in the front and you can feel it twitching and tramlining on every little thing uh, the owner said it doesn't self-center very well and i think he is quite right it does understeer a bit doesn't it God, it's a very strange feeling that the wheel is being pulled around the corner let's get some cold air blowing on me it's boiling in it now When people say the steering wheel doesn't self-centre, what that kind of means is that it feels a little bit jittery in the steering as you try and go dead ahead. And these roads aren't perfect. And so you're feeling like your wheel is being pulled a little bit in your hands. That said, you can feel the road under the wheels quite happily. Leans. Oh my gosh, it leans and rolls so much more than an Alpha should. Of course, though, this is a Nissan, so you can get away with it. Now, in some respects, certainly in the UK market, this was something of an unwanted child. Alpha UK didn't want it at first, but then they decided they didn't have anything below the 33, so they did. It was really Alpha Italy who instigated it. Nissan UK really didn't want it. It was very much foisted upon them. And in fact, this is one of the, or well, the only Nissan I'm aware of that never had a launch. So there was no big fanfare, no party, no event for magazines to come and drive the car at. There wasn't even a brochure at first. In the end, it was just a little pamphlet, a leaflet thing, and uh, half a page inserted into the, uh, into the main range brochure. So yeah, they really weren't trying to push it at all. That said though, it was a great seller, bizarrely, because as I mentioned earlier, Nissan buyers would have been buying cars they wanted to be reliable, not exciting. Yet this thing was relatively exciting in Nissan terms, and yet loaded with Alfa Romeo Italian electric. So not necessarily a portent to future reliability, but they sold a thousand a month for the first few months, certainly. So for the first 18 months or so, Nissan had the market to themselves here in the UK. 1983, they brought out the Cherry Europe. It wasn't until 1985 that uh, the Alpha UK followed suit and brought out the Arna. And that's when things started to kind of fall apart a bit for, for Nissan sales. Oh, rock and roll. Now the flat four is a sonorous little engine. It revs happily, it's not got the major power of the 1.7, but this is a small light car, so it's not such a biggie that it's only a 1.5. Not to 60 is around 10 seconds, and the top speed is about 112, which is frankly more than enough. Also making it a surprise that it was selling a thousand units a month is the fact it was over six thousand pounds which is a lot of money at the time now again being a light car it doesn't matter so much it's got discs at the front but only drums on the back if i hit the brakes hard now we, we stop quite slowly Now when you set off, you will find the choke, which you don't use very much, is actually hidden underneath the steering wheel, making it actually quite inaccessible and easy to forget about. But on a special warm day like today, you don't really use it. Now 
at the driving position despite the fact it's in a Japanese shell thanks to that Italian floor pan has somehow managed to give a full-on Italian effect to the driving position. The accelerator pedal is pretty much where the brake ought to be and my clutch pedal is down where I'd expect my footrest to land. It's also kind of short-legged and long-armed so it's a bit of a weird position to be in but you know you get used to these things if you love Alfa Romeos then you, you accept these things. Or in this case if you love Italian built Nissans, you accept these things. Being based on the ultra practical Cherry, it is of course very easy to see out of, to, to position yourself on the road, got good mirrors, good everything really, because that was a really well thought out car. It does rattle like crazy though. I can hear rattles on the dashboard and the whole thing, especially on this bit of bad road here, it does rattle an awful lot. And it does roll far too much for an Alfa Romeo, really. Now one thing that is interesting is the fact that they chose this body shell, which isn't the most exciting looking body shell, and is also really well known and really well catered for in the European market, as they had a car called the B11 Sunny, which uses the same underpinnings, the same inner wings, the same floor pan, so it would have been all the same work to convert that to an Alpha as well, but it wasn't sold in Europe at the time. So it would have been a unique car that stood out really unusually. It would have perhaps been a more sensible choice. I don't know. And during its life, there was a facelift, which was maybe a slight refresh, but instead of the usual thing, which most companies do, which adds features, they continued to cheapen things out. So as well as the uh, vacuum form plastic in the boot and the footwell, they did things like taking away the black surround of the windows on the five-door model, basically making it less expensive to build. Do not forget Alpha were on the floor when it came to money at the time. We can only assume that Nissan had high hopes that whatever followed in the next seven vehicles were going to be very exciting indeed. We've seen things that looked like a Nissan Prairie, looked like a Patrol, so maybe they were looking at diversifying quite extensively as well as sports cars. But ultimately, uh, that all came to a sudden end when Alfa Romeo, which was owned by the government, it was a state-owned company, was bought out by Fiat. So, uh, no more Nissan Alphas. I'll be honest, it's not a bad car. I've driven cars that handle far worse than this. It's quite soft and it does understeer a little, but it is not a bad thing to be in, in all, all told. It certainly doesn't deserve the reputation the owner has. I will admit it does pitch and roll and jump around a little bit more than I would, I would like it to, but with an anti-roll bars fitted, front and rear, that would really transform this. As you throw it into a corner, it is a little disconcerting how it does roll and there's a slight feeling of disconnect for a second before you feel the road again. It's not sliding, it's not losing control, it just has a certain feeling of not being there for a moment. And that de alpharization the lack of sportiness, does give it quite a comfortable ride. It does float a little over the, the bumps and things. Now the accepted story of this car is that they got it wrong. The Japanese did the styling and the Italians did the electrics. But the simple fact is, there was no choice in the matter. The Italian designers were over a barrel. They had no budget whatsoever to make any changes beyond basically the bumpers and the lights. So to have done as much as they did was quite impressive. Being 85% Italian, despite the fact it's in a Japanese body shell with a Japanese dashboard, was quite a feat. Someone's job must have been to be sitting there counting every single nut, bolt and screw in this car to figure it out. Well, thank you for watching this ride out in a car I've been after driving for a very long time. I saw this car about two years ago on a photo shoot for a magazine and I've been wanting to drive it ever since. Unfortunately, small matter of <coughs> happened in the meantime, so we never got hold of it. Now I'm finally glad to have driven this car. If you've enjoyed this, please do hit like, subscribe and join me again next time. We're driving something completely different.